Um, hello? Uh, great. Uh, so our uh, second speaker is Wenji Ji from MIT, and she's going to tell us about emergent categorical symmetry in critical ga or gapless systems, uh, gapless states, sorry. Uh, Wenji, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about this uh, recent work with Xiao Gang, and it's quite related to what Ryan uh, have talked about. We try to uh, observe the, uh, study the symmetries in critical uh, phases. Um, they can be um, critical phases by themselves or the critical phases on the boundary of some topological orders. And um, just as Ryan discovered, we also found that to fully describe the symmetries or uh, the invariance, some kind of invariance in the system, we can no longer use our conventional notion of symmetry. We need to introduce something called this uh, um, categorical symmetry. So, um, so I'm going to talk about more uh, just through few more examples to demonstrate why we necessarily need this kind of categorical symmetry. So in general, you can consider the uh, critical uh, phases between two uh, gapped phases. And we can take our familiar gapped phases, for example, one has still have some reserved symmetries and the other gapped phases is spontaneous break all the symmetries. And then we ask, uh, what would happen at a critical point? Can we identify all the symmetries? And uh, we have the experience that at the critical point, the uh, symmetry will be enlarged. For example, we all know this example in the one dimension. And when you have a critical theory describing some Landau phase transitions, uh, this critical point is in general uh, uh, CFT. So all the low energy excitations can be separated into left and right movers and the symmetry, the original symmetry G can now act separately on left and right symmetries. So our symmetry is R doubled. <clears throat> we have both them separately for left and right movers. So then we, this is like the famous kramer wanier duality and almost a historical, um, seek that how can we generalize to higher dimension. So this talk I most want to describe in such kind of symmetry doubling at the critical point for higher dimensional case. So first we are going to study this on uh, some, some for, for example, Landau uh, critical transition with G symmetry. And then we first want to identify some so-called dual symmetry and this two um, coming from original symmetry, then it seems we have both the symmetry. However, the second point is we're going to find that we cannot just describe this symmetry by the tensor product of this two, uh, original symmetry and the dual symmetry. Since we found that the charges of um, both symmetries, they in general are not like, they're not uh, mutually local. And so, to really describe their charges in a d-dimensional critical theory, they actually correspond to the data is the same as the topological excitations in one higher dimension topological order. Okay, so let's do start with this uh, isynchronous point, which Ryan has talked. Um, but here the purpose is to demonstrate the three points I have made here. And then I'll show you how to generalize to high dimension. So uh, we still have this icing critical point with uh, spin one half living on the sides and there's a global Z2 symmetry. It describes uh, the, uh, the phase diagram is like this, where we are describing the spontaneous breaking phase and Z2 symmetric phase. However, we, we don't want to like take the full symmetry breaking ground state, which we know is degenerate. We only need to take a representative state, uh, say this cat state with uh, superposition of all spin up and all spin down. Uh, we can do this because 
even though we're interested in some thermodynamic limit phases. But we know if one gets a cat state as his ground state when he solves some Hamiltonian on, on a computer, he can identify that this cat state, this single state, already represent the symmetry, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking phase. And then uh, on the other uh, gapped phase, we have a single Z2 symmetric phase. So the good thing to use this only two representative states is now because they are both Z2 even. So we can restrict our study to only those states that e uh, Z2 even states. And by identifying their wave function, we can still know what phases we're at. So uh, now we have this one single description of this uh, phase diagram. Let's try to find another equivalent description of the same single, mo uh, sing single model. Now the system is uh, icing Hamiltonian with only Z2 even states. And we all can know this from this uh, gauging this uh, Z2 symmetry, we can get this uh, Dürer icing model by such kind of map where in the Dürer model, the degree of freedom now lives on the links. So our original series will naturally have a periodic boundary condition requiring this uh, ZL plus one times Z one equals to one. And the symmetry operator, the or original Z two symmetry operator is the product of this X. So if one do this map, they will find that this Z two operator will be mapped to exactly identity. That's why we must, uh, in the original model, we only need, we must study the Z2 even states. So, and, and the Dewar's emerge, or, or we can say the Dewar symmetry in the Dewar description, we have another Z2 symmetry. And it will also be mapped, uh, be like observed as a identity in the original, dis uh, in the first description. So, this is the map between the Hamiltonian and the operators and the symmetry. And then you can also identify all those one-to-one uh, 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 -one correspondence between all the states. We found that uh, you would just uh, like, for example, take this um, Z2 symmetric states, which uh, take one any spin, uh, spin configuration, uh, act by a Z2 operation. This single state will be mapped to a single domain wall picture. That's why uh, this, all the Hilberts, uh, all the states also has one-to-one -one correspondence. So what we get here is a single system, but with two equivalent description. One with uh, variables on the spins, the other with variables on the links, or we can call domain war variables. And both, uh, in both cases, the Hilbert space has a Z2 projection. Okay, so why do we do this? Uh, this is because we can use this to identify uh, more symmetries at the critical point. Because uh, in the spin description, uh, the single critical point touch the Z2 symmetric states. So this critical point itself has this Z2 symmetry. And then in the dual Z2 uh, description, uh, this critical point um, touches the dual Z2 symmetric state. Actually, the two gapped phases uh, in one description breaks uh, a spontaneous break one symmetry, then in the dual picture, it must break the dual symmetry and vice versa. So in only at the critical point, it is symmetric under both symmetries and all the gapped states are, uh, cannot respect the full symmetry. So from this, we identify that this critical point is symmetric under both symmetry. We have a doubled symmetry here. And this critical point represents this critical phase in a thermodynamic limit. So, um, so since we're only talking about uh, this uh, Z2 even sectors and dual Z2 even sectors, then we all know that this, the symmetry will just act as a trivial action. Then how do, we, how do we observe this symmetry? We can 
since the action is just trivial? Well, we can observe it first. We can, there still represent the charge conservation. We can only have mod two, uh, the charge number is uh, mod two conserved. We can only have even number of them. And moreover, um, we can talk about how the charges under Z2 and charges under dual Z2, how they are related to each other. In fact, they're not just uh, uh, mutually like uh, invisible to each other. Um, they have so-called some, so some kinds of mutual statistics. For example, we, we, you can imagine if we want to excite a single domain wall, then a single Z2 charge, which represents spin down here, when the moving uh, across this domain wall and going back to its original uh, places, it will observe an uh, anti-periodic boundary condition. So it means that this operator will get a minus sign. So this means that this single spin excitation and the single domain wall excitation, they have some mutual statistics, which is just the pi mutual statistics here. So because of this, uh, sorry, we cannot just write this project uh, theory as have a tensor product of Z2 and dual Z2 symmetry. Because, um, act, but then what's a good way to describe it? Actually, the most natural way is to think of it as appearing as the boundary of a Z2 topological order. And let me remind you that take a Z2 topological order, there were E, M, and F excitations. And then uh, we can, the, uh, the critical boundary is described by some as in uh, icing Hamiltonian. And for example, we can, how the quick, quick way to realize it by some effective uh, argument. For example, we can start from some M condensed boundary, then a single E particle on the boundary will cause some energy, so we're represented by this uh, XI term on site energy penalty. And then with uh, two, uh, when this E particle hop around, it will ha have some kinetic energy described by this uh, Z uh, icing coupling term. So we have a uh, effective Hamiltonian describing this boundary of Z2 topological order. And um, uh, in, uh, in one gapped phases is the M condensed phase, in other gapped phase is the E condensed phase. So this single critical point is the icing CFT. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, Wenjie. Uh, actually, actually here, here actually these two Z2, they do not include the duality, right? So actually if you want to include the duality, actually there's I mean, symmetry even larger than, than this, is that right? Oh, uh, what duality are saying? This uh, gauging? Uh, uh, no, just a Kramer, Kramer one and duality. I mean, so you have Z2 cross Z2 two, and one is the, the original Z2, the other is the Z2 of disorder order parameter, but, uh, but you have a Z2 uh, exchange in them. It's like a Z2 uh, exchange E and M. Uh, uh, yes. So it seems like the symmetry, total symmetry is going to be even larger than Z2, may, maybe it's not Z2 cross Z2, but Z2 something other Z2. I mean, there's another Kramer duality. Yeah. Uh, we should, I think we should think that way, this way. In this projected, uh, Hilbert space, we only have this Z2 and dual Z2 symmetry. What kramer one does is the duality map from one icing model to the dual icing model. And you see that this uh, Hamiltonian will retain its original form only at J equals to H. So that's a- Yeah, yeah, right, right. So, so as a critical point, there should be another symmetry or- uh, It's not a- more uh, one additional independent one. It's just to say that this two, uh, two Hamiltonian H and H2 has exactly the same form. Uh, can, can I comment on this? So mm -hmm. as a critical, as Wenger, uh, as Wenger wrote on her slide, the symmetry does not contain or is not the V2 cross V2 delta. The precise statement at the critical point is that uh, the critical icing CFT has a Z2 symmetry and a non-invertible defect. And that's what we just heard from Brian. So the precise statement is that the full symmetry, or more precisely, the full fusion category is the icing category. There's no two Z2 at the critical point. Yeah, but still, still we can ask whether 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 this uh, total symmetry, no matter how we write it, whether it includes the climate. Category. 
right? Uh, I, I think yes. So the answer is yes. The total food and core symmetry is the fusion category, which includes one PQ and one Kramer's Wernier duality. Okay. And that's the final answer mm -hmm. at the critical point. But uh, I think uh, here uh, we don't emphasize the Kramer Wernier duality as a symmetry yes. uh, because at a higher dimension uh, we don't have that. Yeah, so right. we yeah. just purposely ignore that in one plus one okay. D we so, may have this additional uh, Kramer Wernier self dual yeah. symmetry at critical right. point, but we don't stress this at this point. Uh, okay, that's fair, but it's fair in one plus one. Yes, so we don't. Uh, stress the Kramer Wernier duality, but we stress the mutual statistics between the two charges now. We want to include uh, in this fusion category an additional data just to, to describe the uh, mutual statistics between these two symmetry. Um, that's the difference from Ryan's um, talk. Okay. Uh, Okay, but let's complete the story here. So we identify that uh, the right way to describe this pi mutual statistics is to use the uh, topological uh, data in one higher dimension. And that is the, this, this excitation is summarized as the dream field double in, one, uh, in two dimension. And uh, what more we, uh, and then it uh, only at this critical point. Um, so this phase diagram can be think of the phase transition between two gapped phases. In one gapped phases, it spontaneous break the Z2 symmetry. In another gapped phases, it spontaneous break the dual Z2 uh, symmetry. Actually, there can not be a gap state that bo breaks um, both the symmetry. And uh, if, uh, uh, and only at, there's only, uh, if a system want to preserve both uh, symmetry, it must be gapless. And this statement can be made uh, most precise by using Levin's um, proof uh, this year. Um, he identified the one spontaneous break phase uh, characterized by an order parameter and the other spontaneous breaking phase uh, described by some disorder parameter. He proved that uh, if you have both order parameter and uh, disorder parameter, the theory must, uh, must be gapless. And then we want to generalize this one dimensional lesson to high dimension. So we do almost the exact the same exercise. We start with this two-dimensional icing model, and still we have a global Z2 symmetry. We want only restrain to the Z2 even sector. So then we want to have a dual description. That is to gauge this uh, 2D icing model. And we get this um, two-dimensional Z2 gauge theory, which now we set this um, uh, G coupling to the infinity. So this Z2 vertex will have just an infinite, uh, in infinite gap. Um, then what's the, what's the dual symmetry now? Well, that's, that's one of our goal, right? We want to know the critical point, the emergent symmetry. So we find that, we know that uh, if you have a global symmetry in one description, it will be mapped to identity to another, to the dual theory. So actually um, we found that all the closed loop by Z operators, this operator, um, if you ungage it, will correspond to this identity operator. So this uh, closed loop by Z operators is going to be our symmetry generators. Uh, then what's charged under this, uh, this dual symmetry? It's the closed world line of this um, X operator defined on the dual lattice. And indeed, you can check this, uh, this, this operator is charged odd under this uh, symmetry operation. 
And since this charge itself is a one dimensional object, uh, we can, we now call them a one form symmetry if we have a low energy description. So we can write this dual symmetry as Z2 one form symmetry. Okay, then we have a, a phase diagram here um, described in this um, dual description when tuning this um, parameter J and U, assuming there's a single critical point, then uh, we know that in one gapped phases is deconfined phases and there are on the torus, it has fourfold degeneracy and each of this uh, state can be, represent, uh, can be represented by have a fixed value of this uh, charge operator WX uh, of this loop along X and Y direction since uh, this charge operator takes a fixed value, uh, each of these four states spontaneous break this uh, Z2 one form symmetry. And in another phase, um, it is symmetric under this Z2 one form symmetry. It's just a tensor product of this state. So we now also just to, uh, describe these two phases by two representative states. One is the cast state of this one form symmetry and the other is the one form symmetric states. Okay, then we can compare this with the original spin description. Then we know uh, if one state, oh sorry, I think I made some uh, typo here. I should be reversed. When the Z21 form symmetry is spontaneous broken, uh, in the icing description, it's a Z2 symmetric, and in one form symmetry, symmetric state will be mapped to a, a Z2 spontaneous symmetry breaking phase, the cat state. So we also identify now there's only at this, since the critical point touch both the symmetric states. So the critical point has both the symmetry. So we identify a high two dimensional theory where the critical point has uh, doubled symmetry. But now uh, the generalization from the one dimensional two case to the two dimensional case is that the steward symmetry is no longer acting on, on point uh, particles. It's now uh, act on string operators. So we can also uh, identify the so some mutual statistics between this uh, point particle and now a string operator, uh, a string objects. Just to think, uh, you can start from a uh, 2D lattice on towers. If you have this um, Wilson line on the dual lattice going through one non contractor loop, and it acts as a domain wall for the spin operator. So when the spin goes all the way around the other perpendicular direction, it will acquire a minus sign. It views it itself like observe an uh, anti-periodic boundary condition. So in this way, purely on this 2D lattice, we can think there's a mutual prime statistics between this point particle and this uh, string, uh, string objects. And, but more, pre um, more naturally, we should, like view them as the boundary of a three plus a three D topological order, described by this uh, Z two gauge theory. And in this uh, topological gauge theory, there's two kinds of topological excitations. One is the point particle. Here is the string particle. And the in low energy in TQFT, we can observe their mutual pi statistics by taking the by observing that uh, the world line of this E particle and the world sheet of S has a linking number in some four dimensional manifold. And so we see that this Z2 charge and Z2 one form charge in two dimension, it has the same data, has same topological data as the topological excitation in 3D Z2 top, on topological order. And this line object exactly mapped to the 2D line object. Okay, so this is the 2D story and you can see that you can 
um, easily generalized to any general dimension. Um, and first, in any d-dimensional Z2 topological order or Z2 gauge theory, we have two kinds of topological excitations. One is point particle, one some d minus two dimensional objects. And uh, this is a topological excitation. Then the charge of the global symmetry in the d Sorry. Uh, then the char then this uh, gauge theory itself has a lot of uh, has some global symmetry. They uh, the charge of this global symmetry is the world line of this e particle and world history of this uh, s object. And then the, there are two global symmetry. One is one form, and the other is d minus one form. Then, uh, if we just take any d-dimensional icing theory with Z2 even sectors, and then the same system can be described by gauge theory uh, with uh, d minus one even um, states. And then the total symmetry of this projected system uh, is charged. We, uh, the symmetry action acts trivially but the charge is described by the topological excitations in one high dimension uh, Z2 topological order. And from this, we can uh, identify some results. For example, this um, symmetric, there, uh, all the gapped, gapped states, um, uh, for example, the Critical point is symmetric under the total symmetry. And in any of the gapped states, we cannot break all of this total symmetry. Uh, reason is because all the gapped states correspond to some, uh, condens uh, some topological condensation boundary theory of one high dimensional topological orders. And since these topological excitations are not mutually local, they cannot be condensed uh, all simultaneously. That's why the symmetry cannot be fully break. Okay, I've worked you through some this uh, simple examples described, uh, demonstrate with uh, Z2 gauge series and Ising um, series. And this uh, setup actually can naturally be uh, generalized to a discrete symmetry and we all have some uh, discrete uh, dual symmetries. And now we can relate back to our original intuition that in one dimension, the symmetry is like separated into left movers and right movers. And now we are describing in another way by a symmetry and a dual symmetry and how precisely this two can be related is an interesting question. And uh, this, uh, set up by study the theory with restricted uh, Hilbert space and gauge one particular global symmetry, get another gauge theory with the emergent global uh, symmetry and study its critical point. This uh, procedure also uh, works for uh, critical boundary, uh, critical points between um, topological phases. For example, in this um, 3D uh, Z2 gauge theory, we can also uh, gauge the other global symmetry. We will not get the icing model, but some other uh, theory. Okay, uh, with that, I want to thank you. Wenjie, I, I have a question. Um, so your title is called categorical symmetry. Can you mm -hmm. recap what is what are the categorical symmetries you discussed? Because as far as I can tell, all the symmetries are ordinary higher point symmetry. Yes, uh, but we, we are putting two independent symmetries together to, that's the symmetry for this critical point. And we cannot just uh, use our original knowledge by like tensor product of this two symmetry because they're not tensor product. This critical point has two separate the symmetry, well-defined by like higher form symmetry. But when you put them together, 
you cannot just just uh, like use any uh, conventional symmetry to describe it. So we can only describe it by its charges. Uh, and the key point is this two charges has mutual statistics. So the charge is described by this um, modular tensor category in one high dimension. Yeah, there's another point. Uh, the two example is the abelian group. If you have not abelian discrete group, absolutely the symmetry will not be higher symmetry. Yeah, okay, that, that point I get. So I, I'd like to ask the same question I asked Ryan. In what sense is it a symmetry? In other words, it acts on the Hilbert space. Are the, is the Hilbert space in the representation of the symmetry or in, yes. are the two states before and after acting with the symmetry? Are they in some sense indistinguishable? Not, not indistinguishable, but they look the same. In, in what sense is it a symmetry? Uh, we want I think we want to say that this, we talk about some uh, conservation or invariance of this system. So you can define a set of actions. And then if the system is invariant under this actions, uh, we can say like there's some properties, some conservation laws, but they not really form a group, these actions. So we cannot, we may just not call it a symmetry. We can just a set of actions. But uh, there's an alternative way to describe this action just by the charges. Then uh, this charge conservation law is the fusion rules of this category. And the mutual statistics describe the mm, properties between those charges. Basically, I'm saying it's a symmetry is like kind of invariance, like, but it's not a group. You can have a set of op uh, actions. So pragmatically, symmetry is being used if I want to save work in computing correlation functions, I compute one thing, and then I use the symmetry to learn about the properties of another correlation function. You can, can, you can, can I use the same with this category? They also give you water. So I think here uh, we try to, I think Matty asked a really good question. It's uh, uh, this is symmetry is not really defined via transformation. Here we try to infer the symmetry at a critical point by its connecting uh, to the neighboring phase. The, you know, critical point touch two phase. One phase have a symmetry touch another face, another face have a dual symmetry. So in this, in this physical sense, we try to infer the critical point have a both symmetry because they're touching these two so-called symmetric face. And uh, so, so that suggests that uh, uh, there's a, some kind of conservation law, although symmetry action is a, maybe trivial in the restricted Hilbert space, but uh, there should be conservation law. But the critical point, the quasi party are very messy, so the conservation law may not be so explicit. But in the gapped phase, uh, the symmetry and the conservation law, both descriptions are pretty clear. But the critical point, there should be some kind of conservation law which encode both symmetry. But it's a kind of hidden. Uh. Okay, is there any other comments, questions? Okay, if not, uh, let's uh, thank the speakers, both speakers again, and uh, we'll have our next meeting in in two weeks or so. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, thank you.